this is the final engine teardown inspection summary report for the accident that occurred on the Quicksilver GT500 back in November of 2017. The engine that we're talking about here is a Rotax 582 Bluehead. This is a two-cylinder water-cooled two-stroke engine. And the time since overhaul on this engine, um, unverified, but it appears to be in the neighborhood of 297 hours. Uh, the last annual inspection on the airplane was December 2016, so the aircraft was in annual. And the engine has been using a Lucas semi-synthetic oil at 50 to 1 premix and regular gasoline. So right in this area here we start the engine run-up and we were able to identify that the engine run-up only occurred at about 3500 RPM which is not much RPM really for a run-up and the total time for the run-up even at that RPM is just literally a few seconds. So you can see at this point the engine start time is only showing about three and a half minutes on the counter. That's not very much time for this engine to actually heat soak. These guys did a really short run up um, at not very high RPM. This engine is really kind of cold right now. So we would consider this an unacceptable amount of warm up time. If this was the only data that you had available, you would probably jump to the conclusion that this engine had suffered a cold seizure. So as they pull out onto the runway, the total time from when they started the engine until they went to full power was only a little over 4 uh, minutes and 10 seconds. And you'll see in subsequent fashion that we go uh, from takeoff uh, to rotation. Uh, from rotation we climb out and only just a few more seconds until we get the first signs of engine failure and then engine seizure and then engine stoppage right after that. Fortunately, the aircraft remained fairly intact and the injuries were uh, not significant, but um, it did manage to basically destroy the entire aircraft and other than uh, salvaging some components off of it, the airplane was totaled. In part two, we did the engine to that entirely. I'll go back and revisit that um, before we continue into this one. But the end result was that we found the magneto side cylinder was the primary fail point that caused the engine to seize and we're going to now elaborate on what actually took place there. So let's just go through the discrepancies kind of one at a time and we'll talk about them um, as they relate to the reason that the engine failed. We're not going to cover all of the discrepancies um, that weren't pertinent but we'll, we'll keep it pretty much focused on the discrepancies and their significance to the end result that we came up with. No side tank. As far down as I can see in that coil, I don't see any liquid. Well, that would be bad. Should be seeing it right up to the very top of it. The radiator coolant level was found to be low enough that the fluid was not visible through the radiator cap. There was antifreeze in the system, but after draining it, we found that probably less than a quarter of the total system capacity was there. Now this is where it gets very interesting. The system appeared as though it was all hooked up correctly. There was a recovery bottle line coming from the bottle over to the radiator, but upon closer inspection we noticed something was just not right. Normally the line that would come from the radiator would hook up at the bottom of the coolant recovery bottle. In this case, it was plugged. Now, there's no way that that can supply any fluid to the thing. And when we looked at where the bottle went, 
we realized that, oh, someone had just modified this thing. But when we pulled the cap off and looked inside, that doesn't really go anywhere other than it dumps excess fluid back in. But that little fitting, which is actually a uh, fuel tank fitting for Quicksilvers, only stuck inside of the bottle by about three quarters of an inch. There was no physical way that the radiator could suck fluid back into the radiator to replenish it. This is probably one of the key elements that caused the engine failure. If we're going to use improper installation of the recovery bottle as a hypothesis, we need to generate some corroborating evidence. The water pump was intact and operating correctly. There was no physical signs of looseness, play, or leakage coming from the water pump shaft seal. There's a witness hole that drains coolant if the rotary intake valve seal leaks in between the case halves. This rotary intake um, valve shaft is also the shaft that drives the water pump. A small but visible leak was found on the water pump inlet hose, the water pump housing, the case halves, and the motor mount plate on the exhaust side of the engine. However, no leaks or discharge from the radiator were evident, and upon close examination of this area between the case halves underneath the water pump revealed that there is coolant there. However, there's a strong possibility that the fluid leak around the water pump housing nipple, which is located directly above this spot, is the source of this fluid. Looking at the water pump housing nipple, we can see coolant mixed with caked on debris that is obviously accumulated over a long period of time. The majority of this accumulation is on the top of the water pump housing nipple, and the water pump housing is located above the case halves. And because there's no other sources of coolant in this general vicinity, this is most likely the source of the leak on these hoses and nipples on the water pump housing. We can see a step in the casting. We find this typical on other 582 engines as well, and the normal remedy would be to simply rework this area to create a smooth surface for the hose installation. However, we see an example on the out of, outside of the casting seam with a more extreme step. In this case, it appears as though this would be rather difficult to completely eliminate the leak without a significant degree of rework or without replacing the housing. Based on the evidence of excessive tightening of both hose clamps in this location, it would be reasonable to suspect that the previous evidence of leakage was identified and attempts were made to remedy the situation with excessive tightening of the hose clamps. The hose was removed and measured at 1 inch ID and the water pump housing nipple, which is not concentric, was measured at 0.904 on the smallest dimension and 0.978 at the largest dimensions. Based on these anomalies, it is likely that this is at least the primary source of fluid loss within the coolant system. So let's present some corroborating evidence that the engine actually did suffer from the lack of coolant. Evidence that the cylinders achieved temperatures above the boiling point of coolant can be seen on the walls of the water jacket. Primarily on the exhaust port side, you can see the cylinder is dry and chalky looking, whereas on the intake port side, this is the cold side of the cylinder. There are signs of antifreeze still embedded into the surface of the aluminum cylinders. This overheating indication can be seen on both the PTO and magneto cylinders. And although the magneto cylinder is the cylinder which suffered the primary seizure, the PTO cylinder shows the same symptoms. This supports the theory that the root cause of the problem was anathema to both cylinders. Now is where we really get into some of the critical telltale signs. It's the spark plugs that really tell the story. If we look at the magneto side spark plugs, you can see the melting of both spark plug electrodes. These are classic pre-ignition and subsequent detonation indications. The plug closest to the magneto and installed on the magneto cylinder is the spark plug with the greatest amount of degradation. The PTO side spark plugs both show signs of overheating of the ceramic insulator and this is indicated by the white color and the lack of carbon or any other combustion deposits on the ceramic insulator. However, looking at the rest of the spark plug would indicate that the engine has been previously running rich. This can be indicated by the black carbon deposits around the perimeter of the spark plug body. If pre-ignition and detonation are now the hypothesis,
Let's see if we can't corroborate that even further. Looking at the magneto side piston, we can see additional signs of pre-ignition and detonation. The telltale sign is the metal deposits from the spark plug electrodes that are melted onto the top of the piston. We can see that the deposits are positioned in the center of the piston. This is an indication of pre-ignition and then detonation. If we were looking at a scenario of detonation only, the indications would show up as end gas explosions occurring at the perimeter of the piston rather than in the center. The most likely source of pre-ignition would either be carbon deposits or overheated spark plug electrodes. On the Rotax 582, ignition from carbon deposits most often occurs at the hottest spot on the piston and this is typically closer to the exhaust side of the piston. Based on the shock wave disruption patterns of the carbon deposits on the top of the piston, they appear to be fairly well distributed and originating from the center of the piston outward. In addition, the burning away of the cylinder head in the area of the upper ring, the Dykes ring at the pin and ring end gap, is consistent with pre-ignition and detonation high pressure temperature gases escaping between the ring end gap and burning away of the aluminum portion of the piston. It appears as though this area was most likely subject to secondary end gas detonation. This can be identified by the area of clean metal exposed as a result of the localized shock wave pattern that removed the combustion deposits from this area. As this localized area of extremely high temperature and pressure exists between the ring end gap, the velocity and temperature act much like a cutting torch. This melts away the aluminum and the embedding of the aluminum into the cylinder wall is what begins the cascading effect which results in the seizure of the piston. If we compare the discoloration around the perimeter of the PTO piston with the discoloration around the perimeter of the magneto, the failed side piston, you can see that the discoloration has been worn away by the tight piston to cylinder wall clearances. Both pistons most likely looked identical just prior to engine failure. If we look at the bottom side of the piston, we can see signs of overheating. The discoloration of the aluminum is the sign that the piston has been running at excessive temperatures. The indication of discoloration on the wrist pin is also another indication that the piston has been exposed to excessive temperatures for longer than just the period of time from takeoff power application to the engine failure. This supports the hypothesis that the engine may have been losing coolant prior to the landing at the Willows Airport. In addition, the carbon buildup on the bottom of the piston is also an indication of prolonged operation at above normal temperatures. On a normally operating engine, no discoloration or carbon deposits will be evident. The PTO side piston also shows signs that the cylinder and piston had been overheating for some period of time. Both the discoloration and the presence of the burnt on carbon depositants are evidentiary of this phenomenon. Both the rings are floating and free from sticking and this would indicate that the overheating was fairly recent event. Engines that run at higher than normal temperatures have a tendency to also build these carbon deposits within the ring groove causing the rings to stick. At the Dykes ring, this is the top ring, at the end gap location there is evidence of the very first signs of melting on this piston. On the intake side of the piston there are also two vertical striations showing not a visible seizure but an area of extremely high pressure very similar to that that we would see with what we call sympathetic seizure marks that we would see on the exhaust side of an engine suffering from a lubrication injection pump failure or even as a result of simil uh, conditions similar to that that we would see related to a cold seizure. These are indications that the piston is overheating and has expanded to reduce the cylinder to piston wall clearance below tolerances. This pressure was sufficient enough to burnish away the machining marks which are normally visible around the perimeter of the entire piston. On the opposite side of the piston there's also two points of high pressure opposing the pressure points on the intake side of the piston. These will invariably be the first points of failure on the piston and cylinder wall if the engine was allowed to continue to run in this same configuration. The discoloration that encompasses the circumference of the top portion of the piston has been worn away by the high pressure areas of these striations. This is an indication that the discoloration and overheating 
occurred prior to the actual failure of the engine. The machining marks around the perimeter of the piston, which we mentioned previously, are one of the most useful to tools in determining the quality of the engine overhaul and the subsequent operating conditions. Both of the pistons show extremely low wear and indicates that the engine was operating correctly up until the subsequent incident. On the PTO side cylinder, like the pistons, the crosshatch in the cylinder walls and its conditions are one of the prime indicators of a proper overhaul and subsequent operating conditions. The quality of the crosshatch within both cylinders is in excellent condition. The quality of the crash crosshatch would indicate that these are either factory new cylinders replaced at overhaul or perhaps a newer engine with the original cylinders. This condition is only achievable through proper crosshatching and subsequent proper break-in. This will allow the optimal Abbott's Firestone curve, or in layman's term, the ratio of the flat spot to groove on the crosshatch. Only properly crosshatched cylinders, which are broken in properly, will typically look in this good con of condition at around 300 hours. The cylinder crosshatch, in conjunction with the relatively non-existent wear on the piston skirt, as evidenced by the condition of the machine surfaces, are the basis for this conclusion. In our experience, we often see cylinders in this condition operate for an additional three to four hundred hours. Now for the magneto side cylinder. The condition of the magneto side cylinder looks to be similar to that of the PTO side cylinder prior to the engine failure. After the engine failure, transfer of metal corresponding to the seizure locations on the associated piston are consistent with the cylinder in distress and as a result of pre-ignition and detonation and subsequent seizure. So now let's take a look at the um, carburetors. So on the carburetor teardown, the observations that we found on the mag side carburetor was the main jet was a 165, idle jet was a 45, needle jet was 2.72, the jet needle was an 11G2, clip position number four, and the air screw screwed out one and, a, uh, one and three quarter turns. Based on the carburetor teardown observations, we found several anomalies. The first discrepancy was the clip position was in groove number four instead of groove number three as recommended. Moving the clip down, or if you want to think of it as moving the needle up, causes an increase in the amount of fuel and enriches the mixture. Discrepancy number two, the idle air screw was set at one and three quarters turn instead of one turn out from the seated position. Discrepancy number three, the O-ring was missing from the idler jet. And discrepancy number four, the idle jet was a 45 instead of a 55. Although we can provide a fairly lengthy treatise on the probable reasoning behind these anomalies, in this particular fail scenario, we do not feel that this would have any significant implication on the basis for the engine failure and as such we're going to leave this discussion for some other venue. So based on the observation of the spark plugs, piston, cylinder head, we see evidence that both carburetors were running rich in the mid-range of operation. This can be seen by the carbon deposits on the aforementioned components. Teardown inspection on both carburetors shows signs that the needle jet and the jet needle have suffered significant wear. In addition, the circlip that holds the needle in position inside of the carburetor slide also shows signs of significant wear, allowing the needle to rotate inside of the needle jet, causing a wear of both the needle and the jet. The clip should hold the needle securely and not allow the needle to rotate. With vibration, the contact surface between the clip and the needle may wear. However, the clip is spring-loaded to ensure that, that friction is provided to prevent the needle from rotating. Over time, the wear may exceed the limit of the clip's ability to provide tension, and this can be seen where the two contact surfaces of the clip are now in contact with each other, preventing tension on the needle. In this case, the clip can be spun without resistance around the perimeter of the needle. This, in turn, accelerates wear on the clip, needle jet, and jet needle. In addition, the O-ring on the top of the circlip was missing from the mag side carburetors. The purpose for this o-ring is to help stabilize the needle and reduce the amount of vibration and subsequent wear on the needle jet and jet needle. Running rich in the mid-range has a correlative importance in this case inasmuch as excessive carbon buildup can be the source of pre-ignition in many scenarios. But more importantly, it may contribute to the reason for the engine failure occurring at the particular point in this mission profile.
In the cruise approach and landing profile, the reduced manifold pressure accompanied by the excessively rich mixture may have prevented the engine from reaching temperatures conducive to pre-ignition. The needle jet and jet needle provide the mixture setting that correlates with the one quarter to three quarter throttle setting. Once above the three quarter throttle setting, the primary controller of the mixture is the main jet. At full throttle, as in the case of this engine failure, the needle jet and jet needle have no effect upon the mixture. Upon inspection, the main jet is the proper jet and appears to be in operating condition and free from contamination or corrosion. The wear on the carburetor slide is indicative of a carburetor that's been in service longer than the last 300 hours of operation. In addition, the overall condition of the carburetor looks as though the engine overhaul at 300 hours may have been the last time the carburetors were actually overhauled. This is supported by the amount of wear on the needle jet and jet needle, the condition of the O-rings, and the age and deterioration of the gaskets. Having an air leak around the O-ring for the carburetor top cap does have the potential to allow an air leak into the top of the carburetor and transition through the bleed holes in the slide, causing a slightly leaner mixture. This can also be true if the rubber boots on the throttle cables have been deteriorated as well. Although we have ample evidence that the majority of aircraft operating these type of carburetors have deteriorated cable boots, the number of direct failures as a result of this condition remains unknown. There is a sound theoretical basis for concern and the result is invariably a leaner condition with the engine throughout the entire range of operation. And although consider, considered unacceptable, there's enough airplanes operating in this configuration to assume that it leans the mixture only slightly in the entire scheme of things. This being said, in a critical situation, this may contribute to certain failures and the possibility of it contributing to this failure must be taken into account. In the case of the GT500, both carburetors were suffering from degradation of the O-rings around the perimeter of the cap. So let's look at the PTO side carburetor. The observations we had from the teardown were that the main jet was a 165, idle jet 55, needle jet a 2.72, jet needle 11K2, clip position number 4, and the air screw turned out a half a turn. Several anomalies were found on this carburetor as well. First discrepancy was the clip position was in groove number 4 instead of groove number 3 as recommended. This would cause the mixture to be enriched in the mid-range. The number two discrepancy was the idle air screw was set at a half a turn instead of one turn out from the seated position. Discrepancy three, the O-ring was missing from the idle jet. Discrepancy number four, the float level was improperly adjusted. In this case, the float level was set higher than normal. This would increase the mixture throughout the entire range of power settings. This would also support the hypothesis that the PTO cylinder was running richer and as a result cooler this causing the failure of the cylinder to lag behind slightly in its failure in comparison to the magneto side cylinder. Discrepancy number five. The needle jet was an 11K2 instead of an 11G2. The higher code letters will produce a rich mixture below the half throttle setting and below. One of the primary indicators of excessive wear on the needle is a visual inspection of the area with the needle part number stamped into the body of the needle. In this case, you can see an excessive amount of wear to the point where the numeral 2 is completely worn away. This is the area where the needle makes contact with the carburetor slide. And although this clip is tight against the needle groove and it has the O-ring intact, based on the amount of wear, an inspection of the clip reveals that the gap between the clip faces has reached its limit. Experience has shown that this should have been removed from service well over 100 hours ago. Carburetor wear is not only found on the needle jet and jet needle and the E-clip, but on all the moving parts within the carburetor, including the piston slide. All of this wear is symptomatic of a greater problem. The root cause of wear within both carburetors can be attributed to many different factors. Number one, idling at too low of RPM or improper idle mixture settings. In this case, we know that both carburetors are fairly screwed up when it comes to the idle circuit. Second item. High moment of inertia propellers. This aircraft uses a warp drive, three blade, solid carbon fiber, ground adjustable propeller. And this has a relatively high moment of inertia even for the C gearbox. Third item, propeller tracking. And in this case we didn't check it. And along with that we also didn't check propeller balance which can have 
uh, contribution to wear as well. And the last item would be carburetor synchronization, which in our case, we found it to be misadjusted. Depending on the severity of any one of these different anomalies will determine the amount of wear that occurs not only on the carburetor, but the rest of the engine and airframe as well. Although all of the wear is of importance, in the bigger picture, all of the components suffering from wear were not a factor in the primary cause of engine stoppage. In the full throttle configuration, only the main jet is controlling the mixture setting, and the main jets were found to be in good condition and the proper part number with no evidence of modification or corrosion. We must address carburetor synchronization. Although there were the very first signs of pre-ignition or detonation within the PTO side cylinder, they were minuscule in relationship to the pre-ignition and detonation that occurred within the magneto side. Because the root cause of the failure was related to the lack of coolant within the radiator system, we can support this hypothesis by identifying similar indications that occur within both cylinders simultaneously. The correlative signs in this case were supported by the white color of the spark plug insulators, as well as a shockwave burn pattern on the top of the piston, and for that matter on the top of the head, and the first signs of detonation and deterioration of the piston ring end gap on both the PTO and magneto side. And although the PTO side cylinder did not suffer a failure, we speculate that the similar scenario could have occurred on the PTO side cylinder and piston. Typically in failures such as these, the short time interval from full power application to engine failure, in our case approximately 15 seconds, resulted in the failure of the most critical component first. The carburetor synchronization was measured and found to be 40 thousandths of an inch differential with the magneto side carburetor slide open more than the PTO side carburetor slide. Under normal circumstances, this differential would not be critical. However, with the magneto side cylinder carrying a slightly higher manifold pressure, this would increase the pressures and temperatures within that cylinder and most likely be the cause of the magneto side cylinder failing first. Typically, when one cylinder starts to suffer pre-ignition and detonation, the power output from that cylinder dissipates. This in turn transfers the load to the other cylinder, which would in turn increase the load on that cylinder. This may have been the point at which the PTO side cylinder began some initial detonation. However, this component of the analysis is simply speculation. Inspection of the crankshaft, main bearings, connecting rod bearings show no anomalies. In fact, the bottom of the engine appears to be in excellent condition. Inspection of the connecting rod reveals no anomalies. However, it's important to look at the wrist pin and needle bearing race. Typically, when an engine's been running hot for quite some time, we see discoloration in this area of the connecting rod. In this case, there's no evidence of excessive heating over a long period of time. This may provide further evidence that the heating that we see on the pistons was a fairly recent phenomenon. The cylinder head shows indications that are consistent with the findings in the cylinders and on the pistons. And in this picture, the PTO cylinder is on the left and the magnetic cylinder is on the right. The shock wave disruptions of the carbon buildup show typical end gas detonation conditions within the squish zones. That's the outer perimeter of the, of the head. Due to the mass of the aluminum within the head, even with the lack of water within the cooling system, it's typical for the pistons to show the first signs of degradation prior to damage of the cylinder heads. From engine start to application of the beginning of the takeoff run, the total time frame was approximately 4 minutes and 11 seconds. This is a relatively short and inadequate amount of time to warm up the engine and prevent a cold seizure. In addition, the actual run-up itself occurred at a relatively low power setting approximately 3,500 RPM and lasted only about 13 seconds. Under normal conditions, this amount of heat soaking of the engine would be marginally acceptable to prevent a cold seizure. The engine had been sitting for approximately 45 minutes since the last time it was shut down. This time frame would have rendered the engine cold enough to warrant a complete warm-up prior to flight. However, upon inspection, the telltale cold seizure indications were not definitive. A cold seizure can be identified by the classic four-quadrant seizure and the scuffing of the pistons at the edges adjacent to the wrist pin cutaways. A cold seizure is simply the aluminum piston growing in size as a result of heating at a faster rate than the steel sleeve within the cylinder.
this causing a reduction in cylinder to piston wall clearance sufficient to eliminate the clearances necessary to retain a barrier of lubricating oil between the piston and cylinder. This cylinder to piston contact results in transfer of aluminum from the piston into the surface crosshatch of the steel cylinder, in turn causing additional heat cascading into a seizure and sudden engine stoppage. Although the pilot did not indicate that he noticed any anomalies on the engine instruments before takeoff, there is the possibility that these indications were erroneous due to the lack of coolant within the cylinder head. If the water had dropped or had boiled within the cylinder head, it would be very likely that the water temperature would be indicating incorrectly even before takeoff. It is likely that there was a drop in the exhaust gas temperature just after pre-ignition and detonation. However, the time frame from the first indications to engine seizure was only three seconds. Typically, even quick throttle response to pre-ignition in these scenarios is inadequate to change the outcome. We must address carburetor synchronization. Although there were the very first signs of pre-ignition or detonation within the PTO side cylinder, they were minuscule in relationship to the pre-ignition and detonation that occurred within the magneto side. Because the root cause of the failure was related to the lack of coolant within the radiator system, we can support this hypothesis by identifying similar indications that occur within both cylinders simultaneously. The correlative signs in this case were supported by the white color of the spark plug insulators, as well as a shock wave burn pattern on the top of the piston, and for that matter on the top of the head, and the first signs of detonation and deterioration of the piston ring end gap on both the PTO and magneto side. So let's summarize what we have found here. It's likely that the aircraft had lost a significant amount of cooling during the previous legs of the cross-country flight. The most likely source of this coolant loss, of course, was the water pump housing nipples. This loss of coolant, coupled with the short run-up time, allowed the aircraft to get airborne before the cylinder heads had reached a critical temperature. And then within 15 seconds after full throttle application, we saw the first signs of pre-ignition and detonation. And three seconds after the first signs of detonation, we can hear the engine begin to seize. And the engine had come to a complete stop within the following four seconds after that. So our conclusions are as follows. The poor quality of construction of the water pump housing made it difficult, if not impossible, to properly seal the hose to nipple attachment without at least replacement of the parts. The coolant leak appears to have been evident and present for quite some time, and the identification and recognition of this leak as a significant and potential hazard could have prevented this accident. Proper installation of the radiator recovery and overflow bottle would likely have refilled the radiator, and based on the observed amount of leak, proper installation of the recovery bottle would likely have prevented the engine failure. In addition, the diminishing quantity of coolant in the recovery bottle would have reinforced and identified the significance of the existing leak as a potential hazard. Conducting a more thorough pre-flight with the inclusion of coolant level check most certainly could have prevented this particular failure. As with so many accidents, there's a whole chain of events that had to happen in order for the final outcome to be realized. And although we've narrowed down the chain of events to four primary areas, this leaves four corresponding opportunities for the pilots to have intervened and prevented the failure of this engine and the subsequent crash.